Brown is accused of abducting Ashanti Billy from J.E.B. Little Creek Fort Story three years ago and killing her. Her body was found in Charlotte, North Carolina, weeks after she disappeared. Breaking news now in the Ashanti Billy case. Her accused killer, Eric Brown, won't stand trial for the crime right now. A young culinary student and an aspiring chef, Ashanti Billy had her life mapped out and had dreams of reaching great heights. When she asked if she could work at a sandwich shop, her parents let her because the workplace was inside a military area. But despite all precautions, the unthinkable happened. Ashanti went to work one day and never came home. The police continued to search for her and soon uncovered her body far away from where she lived. As they worked on the case, the man who orchestrated her demise came to light and it was someone no one would have ever suspected. So, who was this man? How did he know Ashanti? And why did he take her life? Let's dive into the tale of Ashanti Billy, a young girl whose life was snuffed out by someone who was supposed to protect the people. 19-year-old Ashanti Billy was a college student at the local culinary school and daughter to Navy veterans Brandy and Meltony Billy. She grew up in a loving, supportive family and had many dreams. Her parents had divorced, but they were doing a great job of co-parenting, and Ashanti never felt that the problems between her parents were interfering with her life or her happiness. At the time of the incident, she was living in Virginia Beach. She had a dream to open her own bakery someday, and attending culinary school was the first step towards that goal. She also worked at a sandwich shop at the Joint Expeditionary Naval Base in Norfolk, Virginia. When she first asked her parents if she could work there, both her parents let her despite the demanding working hours. Food businesses usually open very early in the morning and close late at night. But as the job was in a protected environment, they never worried much about her security. Ashanti believed that this job would be a great way to give back to the military community. Her parents believed the same, but it ended up being a tragedy for their daughter in a way that they'd never expected. Before coming to Maryland, Ashanti had to move a lot with her parents. Germany, New York, Texas, and Alabama were their homes before they settled here. Even though her parents were in the Navy, Ashanti couldn't join there because she had been diagnosed with epilepsy when she was a child, so she chose to follow her passion and become a baker and chef. After joining the culinary school, Ashanti found an apartment and was living with a few flatmates. According to her mother, it was working out well for her. She went along with her roommates. She also had a boyfriend who was in basic training in South Carolina, and her mother said that they had a great relationship. Her father, Meltoni Billy, remembered her as a peppy child. Bubbly, quirky, uh, nerdy, friendly, lovable. By mid-September of 2017, Ashanti had settled well into her new job and apartment. Her boyfriend would be graduating in a month and she was preparing to attend the ceremony. One morning, she left her apartment complex at 4 a.m. She had to clean the store as they were expecting a health inspection at their shop. Roughly at 5 in the morning, Ashanti drove through the naval base gate to arrive at her work. Security footage had proof of her entering the area, but she never showed up at her workplace. She was one of the most reliable employees in the shop and never missed any of her duties. When three hours passed by and she didn't show up, a co-worker called her on her cell phone to see what was taking her so long. And to her surprise, a man picked up. Someone else answered, it was a man, and he told me that um, he found her phone in the dumpster, but I thought she just probably misplaced the dumpster. He told her that the phone looked in good condition, so he picked it up, hoping that the owner would call to collect it. A second co-worker called Ashanti's number and was told the same thing. She didn't pay much attention and went back to work. But when Ashanti didn't show up at her class, that's when her friends began to speculate that something terribly wrong had happened to her. Ashanti's parents and the police were soon notified. Her parents also tried reaching her, but when they didn't get an update from her, her mother Brandy posted a video on Facebook asking everyone to help with any information they might have on Ashanti and her whereabouts. She also asked for their prayers. I'm begging of everybody. <laughs> Please pray for my baby. <laughs> Police kept searching for the young girl, but they couldn't find a lead. Authorities issued statements and asked the locals to help with the search. We're here today to talk about uh, a missing person, uh, Ashante Billy, uh, who is a new member of our community uh, within the last month, uh, moved down here, uh, and has gone missing under what we would say is suspicious activity. 
The police traced her phone and found it in the dumpster that was mentioned by the strange man who had picked up her call. The dumpster was four miles away from the naval base. No one knew how her phone had reached a location so far away. Five days later, police finally found Ashanti's vehicle, a cream-colored 2004 Mini Cooper, five miles away from their location, parked on a cul-de-sac on the 9500 block of Lakeshore Drive in the Ocean View section of Norfolk. But it was abandoned, with no sign of the girl anywhere. The car was parked in front of a house, and the owner mentioned that the car had been there for at least a few days. He didn't have a clue that the police were looking for it, else he would have notified them. The car had its doors unlocked and windows slightly rolled down. The keys were on the passenger seat, and the police found clothing items at the back of the car, including Ashanti's work shirt. They also found pants and a pair of shoes, which seemed to have been removed from her body. The clothes had traces of dirt in them. Soon, the FBI got involved and started looking for her. They announced a $10,000 reward for any tips related to her disappearance. Her workplace also announced a $10,000 reward, making the total $20,000. People were also allowed to sign up as volunteers for her search party. Authorities soon retrieved the security footage where Ashanti's vehicle was seen entering and then leaving the naval base. The gate Ashanti used for arriving at work was reportedly blocked by a road accident, so she left through the same gate to drive around and enter the base through another gate, and that's what the cameras pick it up. The person who appeared in the driver's seat in the video seemed to be wearing dark, colored clothies, which matched the description of Ashanti was likely wearing on that day. So, it was unlikely that someone else was driving her car. One also needed to produce an ID card to enter the naval base, so it couldn't have been anyone else but her. This is where the story took an interesting turn. Cameras picked up Ashanti's car driving around her sandwich shop, but a camera later picked up her leaving the base once again, this time through the second gate. The face of the driver was still unrecognizable. However, this time the driver was wearing light-colored clothes. Ashanti, or the person driving her car, reportedly left the area at 5.30 a.m. or 5.32 a.m., but the other details were unclear. But because of the angle of the camera, they was not able to see whether um, was it her driving, was, you know, was it an additional occupant in the car, was she being forced to leave? When they checked with the authorities of the base, they were unable to help. At one point, her parents wondered if the military was being truthful and not giving them the actual details of the incident, but there was no way for them to prove anything. Not even a simple call. It made me start saying, I mean, is there something to hide? Do y'all know something? And then the police were finally able to crack the case. On September 29th, 300 miles away from the scene, at the back of a church in Charlotte, North Carolina, they found the body of a young girl that had started to decompose. The body didn't have any clothes on her and was in a horrible state. Her arms were raised and were bound inside a dark colored sweatshirt. She was lying on top of a plastic sheet. The police also found plastic gloves near her body. Upon primary inspection, they didn't find any knife wounds or gun wounds on her. It was difficult to identify how the woman had passed away. When they heard about the body, Ashanti's family members were in disbelief and had faith that it wasn't their beloved child. As the family awaits further updates, we ask that you continue to keep us in prayer and pray that this is not Ashanti Billy. But the investigators were able to identify the young woman. The body was of Ashanti. Someone had taken her life, and quite brutally so. Her parents were absolutely devastated as they issued a press release. Our desire and our prayers were answered. She is home, she's home with God. And, and, and we're okay with that. Now there was only one thing to do, find out who did this to her. Authorities employed a talented team of investigators to solve the case as soon as possible. There is a team of dedicated investigators who are determined to, to find out what happened in this case. Ashanti's family held a funeral for her. Her near and dear ones attended, remembered her fondly, and prayed for her departed soul. Her father gave a heartfelt speech as he remembered his daughter, and his words brought tears to everyone's eyes. Don't be sorry for my loss. Be grateful for God's gain. As the investigation continued, Ashanti's friends and family raised multiple questions. Her mother, Brandy, questioned the safety of the area. Where's the security at? There have been failures the whole way down. After four weeks of searching, the police finally had a lead. Ashanti's co-workers came out with a name, a person who had been harassing her for quite some time. They called him a creep, 
and said that he made Ashanti very uncomfortable. His name was Eric Brian Brown, and he was 45 years old, and the shocking part of it? He was a retired Navy veteran. The co-workers eventually deduced that he probably worked at the laundromat next to their shop, but he didn't. However, he was allowed inside the base, supposedly, because he had served in the military for 21 years. He wasn't working there, but as he wasn't doing anything unlawful, no one was bothered about his presence at the base. Ashanti's co-workers said that sometimes they gave him rides too. I never took him home, but like, I took him to stores across the street because that's what he wanted to do. After the complaints, the police began investigating Brown's movements to understand how he landed himself in this case. It didn't take them long to understand that he was homeless and slept in various buildings on the naval base. He worked as a day laborer to sustain himself. He also helped build the sandwich shop where Ashanti worked. Shockingly, when police checked his whereabouts, they found that Brown was already in police custody for trespassing in the area and was arrested on the day after Ashanti's body was found. When writing his details, he wrote Charlotte, North North Carolina as his home address and said that he frequented between the two places. Police had found Ashanti's body in Charlotte and this raised their suspicions further. After his arrest for trespassing, he was still being held at the prison as no one came to free him. The police marked him as the prime suspect for the case and brought him for interrogation for the first time on October 10th, 2017. When police asked him if he had heard anything about the recent incident at the base, at first he refused and then he claimed that he'd heard something about a missing girl, but he refused that he knew anything about Ashanti. His behavior was strange, and his claims were pretty incoherent, so the police kept him on their radar. As the police asked around, many witnesses came forward with statements against Brown. A few of Ashanti's co-workers claimed that Brown repeatedly flirted with Ashanti despite their age gap. Many others said that they felt uncomfortable with Brown advances. He even made crude remarks about the black community. He said that he hated African American women because they were gold diggers. The police also spoke to a few of the inmates who were in prison with Brown. One of them claimed that Brown told him, there ain't nothing like the first taste of blood. Sometimes it makes you do things that are inexplicable. Whatever he meant with those words, they were indeed disturbing. Police soon got their hands on more evidence. New security footage showed Ashanti's car at an intersection in Norfolk. It had a somewhat clearer appearance appearance of the driver, who was about 5 foot 9 and was wearing light-colored clothing. He pulled over at the intersection, got out of the car, and tossed something into the construction dumpster. It was Ashanti's phone, which would later be found by construction workers at the site. Ashanti was only 4 feet 11, and it was obvious to the police that she wasn't driving that car. Police made the footage public and asked for help from anyone who could identify the driver. On October 31, 2017, the FBI received a call from a man who said that he knew who the person was in the car. He claimed it was Brown and said that he had worked with this man as a day laborer, so this man was certain that he wasn't making a mistake. The way the person walked and moved in the footage had to be Brown. Investigators called Brown again, and this time, his narrative changed. When asked to give recollections of his whereabouts on the day of the incident, he simply claimed that he couldn't remember and said something about walking around from one gate to another. The police got a warrant to search his phone. Tracing it told them that he had used the phone on all days in September, except for the day a shot he went missing. They also checked the surveillance footage to see if he was telling the truth about walking from gate to gate, but they found nothing. He was also not seen leaving the base during this period. However, on September 19th, he was caught magically returning to the base from the outside. If he hadn't left the base, how was he returning? And if he had left the base, why didn't the cameras pick him up? That's because he drove out of the base in Ashanti's car. His phone search history also showed disturbing results. He'd searched terms like, police looking for man, missing woman, and Norfolk police looking for man in connection with homicide. He also checked Norfolk news websites repeatedly, and the dates were around eight days before Ashanti's body was found. Investigators then conducted a DNA test. They found an unidentified male DNA sample on two clothing items found in Ashanti's car, and they matched perfectly with Brown. On November 9, 2017, Brown was arrested and charged with homicide. He would face a maximum penalty of life in prison if convicted. Ashanti's father was very upset after learning the identity of the man who had taken his daughter's life. Military men are supposed to protect the country, not cause rackets in it, and this man had done exactly that. Your job is to protect this country, to protect every life, and you took the freedom of my child. You took her life. 
And that's it's, it's unacceptable. As the investigators dug deeper into the case, another question came up. Why the church? Why didn't Brown dump the body elsewhere? Further probing revealed that the church was where Brown went to vacation Bible school as a child. It was also close to his family home. Dr. Michael McLean, pastor at the East Stonewall AME Zion Church, also expressed his disbelief over Brown's choice of place to hide the body. He was not from Charlotte, which confused everyone initially. Didn't understand how she ended up here on this property here in Charlotte, being from Virginia. Uh, what the connection was all about, and, and now the pieces are put together pretty much. But what did Brown have to say about the incident? Well, he made a weak plea and claimed that he had blacked out for a few days and couldn't remember anything from those days. In fact, he couldn't even remember if he had done anything to Ashanti. Ashanti's parents were furious when they heard his statement. You know exactly what you were doing. You preyed upon an innocent young lady who happened to be my child, and that was the biggest that was mistake. mistake that you made. Brown was charged with abduction and homicide, but according to the U.S. Attorney's Office, he could also get charges of assault. When the officers found Ashanti's body, her underwear was found by her head. The rest of her clothes were found inside her car. Ashanti's father wasn't satisfied with those charges and wanted Brown to pay for what he did to his daughter. I'm not going to accept just the murder charge or the kidnap because you did more than just murder and kidnap. You done, you did a lot. Ashanti's mother Brandy was upset because they thought they were sending their child to work in a secure environment. She still blamed the lack of security for the incident. This was allowed to occur on a naval base. It could happen anywhere. They stressed that security measures should be strengthened to ensure everyone's safety and not just inside the base. The case garnered media attention. The system already had the amber and silver alert, but what about endangered adults who went missing? For them, authorities petitioned for a new alert, which was eventually named Ashanti Alert in honor of the late Ashanti. Her parents fought for that to change and Virginia lawmakers created an Ashanti Alert. It allows for widespread public notification if an adult between 18 and 64 disappears and is believed to be in danger. This alert is believed to fill the gap between the age brackets for the Amber and Silver Alert and hopes to save more lives. Ashanti's parents would never be able to bring Ashanti back, but they hoped that this alert would help those endangered adults who couldn't get help anywhere in such situations. It goes beyond saying that Ashanti would be very proud of her parents if she was alive. In 2017, after a thorough examination, the judge ruled that Brown wasn't fit to stand trial, and the news devastated Ashanti's parents. After 18 months of treatment, in December 2019, the judge ruled that Brown must not be medicated forcibly until the court could decide whether he should be treated for fitness for a trial. Brown has been in a federal facility undergoing treatment for schizophrenia. The judge said Brown's competency cannot be restored right now, so the trial is postponed indefinitely. The authorities in charge were giving him antipsychotics and wanted to add one more medicine, but it required orders from the court because Brown refused to take those medicines. Since Brown wasn't in a state to understand it, it wouldn't be lawful and fair if he stood the trial. But this meant that justice for Ashanti would be pushed further down. Her mother mentioned that they were looking at other options and legislation that they could push. This development did didn't, however, mean that the case was over. If Brown's mental status is ever restored, he will face the charges. Authorities were doing everything in their power to restore his status, but it was still an uncertain procedure. They are working to get him committed to a government facility at this time. As of 2024, Ashanti's family is still waiting to receive justice for their daughter. So, what did you think of this case? Do you think Ashanti should have informed someone when Brown was continuously flirting with her and making inappropriate advances? Do you think talking to her parents would have saved her life? Let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching the video. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel.